So we just had an election and things are a little bit more clear about what the future of the country could look like as far as taxes, laws, and other things. As we know, Donald Trump has won the presidency and the GOP, the Republicans, have also won a majority in both the Senate and the House. So let's talk about what we could expect for your taxes. And this is my hopefully non-biased views of what could happen based on what's realistic, what they have the numbers for, and some you know cause and effects. So let's jump into it. So if you're new here, my name is Ryan Beals. I'm the owner of Ryan Beals CPA. We're based out of League City, Texas, and we are a virtual firm. So we don't have an office, but I do have a very large digital presence where we help our community and the business owners lower the taxes. So um, I've been a CPA for almost 10 years now. My license is in, here's my license. I'm licensed in the state of Texas, and I've been doing taxes for almost that amount of time as well. So let's talk about taxes. Let's talk about the future, what I think could happen based on what has been said by the various candidates, what's realistic, and what could be what you can expect from that. So first of all, let's talk about the numbers themselves, because it's not always enough to have a just majority. Sometimes you need more than that. So as of right now, there are some seats that are still up for grabs, so it's not a complete picture, but we do know that there is a majority in both the Senate and the House. So 100 people, 100 representatives in the Senate, um, there's like 400-something in the House. It is it, it, Things work a little bit differently in each, but typically you need to get a vote passed, you need at least 50%, right? So 51%. However, things get a little bit dicey and a little bit more uncertain when you start to get into the Senate. And that's not because of getting the laws passed themselves. That's the problem comes with the filibuster. It takes 60 votes. So about two thirds of the Senate needs to approve a law to come to the floor for a vote. So in other words, you need 60 votes to get a law in front of people to actually vote on it. So to pass a law, you act, you need 50, but realistically, you need 60. So that's where things are going to come. Uh, unfortunately for the GOP, or fortunately if you're a Democrat, the getting past the Senate is a, is it makes it a bit harder because of this rule. So that does muddy the water a little bit, but that doesn't mean that. Nothing can get done. It just means that some of the more permanent things, some of the very, very like ground shaking, you know, big waves making kind of laws that we've seen in the past uh, are less likely to happen. But so one of those things, and I have seven different categories here, by the way, is one of the one of the topics that has been brought up from Donald Trump is the idea of tariffs. It is, and he's made it to the extent to where he has brought up the idea of replacing tariffs from the traditional income tax, as we know today. I think that that specific piece might be a little bit unrealistic, mostly because of the law or because of getting that vote from the Senate. You need help from the Democrats, which is going to be probably is It's going to be very challenging to get anything. Three, four people to come over to work with the Republicans on this. So it's not likely, I think. So as far as a complete overhaul of the taxes, I'll just go ahead and say that. I don't think that's likely. It could happen. You know, the right coalition of people could come together. The perfect storm of, you know, mostly Republicans and some Democrats that had the right incentives. It could happen. It's not impossible. But given the current landscape, I think that it's very unlikely. Now, as far as taxes, my work is mostly an income tax. So when you say replace income tax with tariffs, I can speak on the income tax part, but not so much the tariffs. So based on the rhetoric, I will say that it's likely that there will be some tariffs, which are a completely different part. That's a different professional. I think it's likely that the tariffs will increase, 
But as far as income tax being completely replaced, I don't think that's realistic. Maybe I'm wrong. Could be. Who knows? But that's my personal opinion on that part. Now, the tariffs, like I said, I do believe that there'll be some increases in various places. What that is, not sure. But uh, like I said, maybe a different professional could have a better, more insight on that. Uh, the next thing is what is realistic, right? So one of the big pieces of legislation that came from the first Trump administration was the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act from 2017. This was a change in the tax code. It didn't replace the tax code completely. It was more like a Band-Aid that was put on and affected, adjusted some of the things like the tax rates, how depreciation was structured, how the standard deduction, there used to be things called exemptions. Uh, you got a larger exemption for you know how many people you got in your house. That's gone away, but the standard deduction has increased because of that. Now, that specific piece of legislation had two sections of it. It was, first was the corporate part that had the tax rate come down to, I believe, 21%, and that is permanent. That is with us until it is changed. And the second part has more to do with individuals down the street like me and you after the 2025 tax year. So as I record this video, it is 2024, it's November. So we would, uh, in the current timeline, it would, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act would be in effect for this tax year, so the year that we finish out and then file in, in April, and the following year, 2015, and we would file the final year of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in 2016 for the 200, or excuse me, 2026 for the 2025 tax year. So that is with the assumption that nothing gets done, that they just let it expire, sunset, and go off into the wind. Now that we have a similar makeup as to what we had in 2017, I think that if anything were to happen with the tax laws, I think that you would see a lot of these provisions in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act extended. Maybe a couple of years could be, you know, a decade. Who knows? The prior, so it's, it got passed since 2017. So the 2017, I believe, was the first year. And it ended in 15. So that was about eight years. That's that's a convenient number. But um, I think it's likely that it will get extended for at least another eight and um, be something that could be argued on in the next election. So some things that could be affected in that, the tax rates themselves. So <clears throat> one thing, one of the biggest pieces that you know, actually affected individuals was the tax rates. The tax rates were generally lower under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So if they were to expire, then the tax rates themselves would go up. Now, there is another piece of the tax tax rates, and that's the brackets themselves. So you had the rates of the percentages actually as you move up, and you had the brackets as you go through them, right? So, you know, your first ten thousand dollars we pack be uh, taxed at say ten percent. Your next uh, past that might be pa might be taxed at twelve percent. Uh, making the brackets wider instead of being like your first ten thousand being taxed ten percent, maybe your first fifteen thousand is taxed at ten percent. That number is something that's set by Congress, and it typically is a year-to-year -year number. It's kind of a way for them to account for inflation. So, um, But the tax rates themselves could be extended. So great news if you're looking for lower tax rates. could uh, That might be a piece that's up for extension. Next thing is 199, um, or other words known as QBI deduction. Uh, so this is a topic that when when I was learning – the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, just the QBI, took us about a week to figure out. <laughs> just being honest with you. It took a while. An entire tax season to perfect it and figure out what the heck is going on here and getting it all correct, getting all lined up. So this is a massive sim simplification. But generally what the 199A deduction is, QBI, is that for business income, so if you're not a business owner yourself, is that 20% of your business income, you receive that as a deduction. So if your business made a net income, revenue minus expenses, $100,000, 
generally you would get a deduction of about $20,000 for QBI. That is something that would have expired at the end of the 2025 tax year. That is something that, if that is something that Congress has their eyes on, then it's very likely that something like that could get extended. In the last piece that actually affects people in a meaningful way is bonus depreciation. So when bonus depreciation, well, back up about what bonus depreciation is. So if you were to buy a large asset, so manage, imagine like construction company bought a large um, truck. Well, let's not use truck. They bought a large piece of equipment. We'll just be general. Large piece of equipment, and that equipment cost hundred thousand dollars. When the tax laws first came out, you could you could take depreciation on that hundred thousand dollars, and it could also be a used piece of equipment. Prior to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, it used to be you could only be new equipment, but with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act (TCGA), then it could also be a used. But as the years have gone on, as we've gotten closer to it expiring, the depreciation for bonus depreciation has gradually decreased from 100% to 80% to 60% and is gradually just falling off until it would expire in the 2020 after the 2025 tax year. I think that that is another piece that could get extended. I think there's a chance that we might be able to go back to 100% depreciation for bonus depreciation instead of having it like 50%. And there's even a chance, I believe, that there could be even retroactive. Congress has kind of done this a few times retroactively where you could take bonus depreciation as like 100% and amend a prior year where previously you could take 60, now you could take 100. So I, I believe that's a piece that could change. Not for sure, but it could go as far as that. But the bonus depreciation part to where you can take the expense sooner, I do believe is a big piece that is realistic for what you expect if there is going to be any tax law changes. Now, everything else is kind of like the traditional political footballs. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was kind of like the shining star in the hill of the Trump administration for the you know the first term. It, it's one of his uh, crown achievements for that term. So if anything, I believe is going to get adjusted, I think it's that. But, you know, the other traditional political footballs are also up for grabs. Next thing I could think that could uh, be adjusted are credits for things like the child tax credit. Right now, it is about $2,000 per kid for kids that are under, I believe it's 17. In the past, that's been more, it's been less, depending on what's going on in COVID. It was more, other times it's been less. I believe that there's a chance that that, is, that number could go down, like the credit amount per kid could go down. It could be, I believe it's been like $500 in the past to 1000 I don't think that's something that'll just go away. I think it's more realistic that the number for the amount per kid might just be lower. It could be also increased too. I don't know that for sure. It could also be increased. Uh, what I do think is most likely is that the working requirement to receive this credit might be increased and in that you phase out to where if you earn too much to where the credit goes away, if you're too high, if your income is too high, that number might get lower to where it, more taxpayers that are making more money might not receive that credit. So as far as changes to the child tax credit, I think that's the areas that could be more likely to see. Other areas that are kind of in that same kind of area are credits for college. So one of the big credits is your four-year education. There's a large refundable credit for that. A lot of times the higher income taxpayers don't receive that because the phase out is rather low. Uh, most middle class people receive it when you get started getting up into like upper middle class, that, that credit starts to go away. Uh, I You might be able you might see that threshold be lowered a little bit to where only lower income taxpayers receive a, a benefit for that script for that credit. Um, just based on rhetoric that you see from, from the party itself. That is what I think that's, I, I don't believe that is a, one of the most likely things, but it is something that when I'm looking at things like, Oh, obvious targets, I think that could be one. Um, so Child tax credit and college credit, I believe it is the, uh, there are two credits for college, American Opportunity Credit 
and the life learning credit. Those are the two credits. I believe that the thresholds for phase out could be lowered to make it harder for higher income individuals to receive those credits. All right. Next thing is one of the big pieces of legislation from the Biden administration was the Inflation Reduction Act. And in that were a several provisions for increased credits for things like energy efficient appliances, electric vehicles, solar production, things like that. I think that as far as what the GOP are looking to take away or repeal, I think that's a big target. So as far as getting credits for purchasing things like energy efficient appliances, which AC units is a big piece of that. Heat pumps were a big thing. I'm in Texas, so the AC thing is something that sticks out to me the most, but there were other things like geothermal, a lot of green energy kind of stuff. There were big credits for that. I think there's a chance that that could go away, that if you have a rollover of a credit that goes in the next year, I don't think they'll do away with that. I think it's more likely that it'll be like after this year, we're not doing it, or they may just decrease the credit amount. So I think that is a piece that could go away that could either, it could range from completely repealing it to just lowering the numbers, having some increase of threshold for uh, a limit on income. If you earn too much, maybe they put a limit to phase out on that. Those are all areas that I think could go away with the um, administration coming up. And the last thing is what will it take to do more. So to to do more, you're going to need help from the Democrats. And there's a couple different ways you can do it. There's a couple different coalitions that could be formed with the Democrats, depending on what you're trying to get done. So to get something more permanent, something bigger, something wider reach, more sweeping kind of legislation, the big kind of stuff that's like historic, right? When you think about different administrations, those kind of laws, those kind of changes, you're going to need 60 votes to get past the Senate. So that means that you're going to need, at the, at the time of this video, it looks like the Republicans are going to have about 52 in the, in the Senate, which is a majority, but it is not a super majority. So they need 60. So you're going to need as much as eight people, eight Democrats from, uh, to come over and support some legislation for you. Now, there are a, are a couple ways that they that the Republicans could concede on some areas to get something bigger done. This depends on what group you're trying to do. There are different groups of Democrats that, uh, depending on what kind of laws, like for instance, there are a set a a set of Democrats that are more corporately aligned. If you are promising some sort of promises for uh, tax cuts or some sort of benefit for the corporations. I think it's possible that you could peel off in that way. There's also more of like the left wing, left wing populist kind of Democrats. Uh, you could possibly entice those with increased child tax credit, and the energy production, things that are going to help the everyday kind of people by increasing child tax credit, not touching the college piece of that could be another way. Um, increasing standard deductions. Anyways, they, they could help lower income people to increase or to lower their taxes, I think is a way that they could entice some of uh, those Democrats to come over. It, but that is to that is the that is what's going to be required to get the 60 votes to pass something big. Otherwise, the changes are going to be like little adjustments here and there, and they're going to be temporary, like the original Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So... Um, I hope that's helpful. These are just my predictions. I hope that was at least somewhat unbiased. I mean, I have my opinions about things, but at the end of the day, the laws are what they are, and I can only predict what I see on the board, what's re what's realistic, and account for that. So if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comment. Let me know in this video if you have any comments. I'm sure people have no feelings about this video. <laughs> we'll see. So, uh, but if you need help with your taxes, especially if you're in the League City, 
greater Houston area, I'd love to talk with you. You can schedule a consultation online by going to ryanbealcpa.com and scheduling a free consultation. I don't charge consultations. Tax season's coming up, and I would love to help you and your business save on taxes and hopefully help your business out, get it growing, and I hope to hear from you soon. Uh, thanks for Thanks for listening.